I would like to share with you a story about my friend Mark. Here is Mark. Mark is a 45-year-old university professor. He is married to a successful young woman like me, and he has two wonderful children. Like many of the fathers that I know, he is the one responsible for driving the kids to school every day. On a particular morning, he wakes up the kids, he helps them get dressed, and he drives them to school. He is usually in a hurry as he he has to get there on time. On that particular Monday morning, everybody overslept. Mark was extremely anxious to get everything done on time. The kids were complaining about the rush, and on top of it all, he couldn't find his car keys. He panically searched for them in his pockets, his backpack, the kitchen table. The keys were nowhere to find. He normally placed them on a fixed location so that he didn't have to look for them every morning. That was the coffee table in the living room. But on that particular day, the keys were not there, and his brain wasn't helping either because the only thing he could remember was that the keys should be put on the coffee table. He had strongly associated that location with his keys. So, what do you think he did? What would you do if you were in his place? Well, he tried to remember what was the last moment that he saw his keys, and the events that followed. In hope that this successful, this recall of memories would lead him to the answer, and you would probably do the same, right? Because that normally works. But have you ever wondered why? What is in our brain that allows us, first of all, to form such associations and then to use them to recall a particular memory? Let's take a look at Mark's brain. Deep inside lies this primitive structure that looks like a seahorse. It is called the hippocampus. On the tip of it, you see two round spheres. These are the amygdala. Both of these regions are critical for learning and memory. This is where we think that these kind of associative memories are formed. Now, deep inside the hippocampus, neurons communicate with each other through a series of electrical impulses that travel from one cell to the other, much like these electrical signals that you will see in a second. Now, if you zoom in into a particular pyramidal neuron or hippocampal neuron, like the one shown here, you will find thousands of synaptic connections. These tiny little mushroom-like structures are the site of neuronal communication. When established between a presynaptic action, like the green one shown here, and the postsynaptic cell, like the purple one, they allow the transfer of information from one cell to the other, leading to a series of electrical waves. These traveling waves are the essence of everything our brain does: thinking, dreaming, remembering, and so much more. So, where in this complicated universe do memory associations reside? Before I give you the answer to this question, I'd like to share with you a series of experiments, groundbreaking experiments that were recently done to help us understand this question. In the lab of my friend and collaborator Alcino Silva. Mice are routinely used to study the formation of associative memories. Not only that, but these scientists also try to find out which are the particular cells that contain such memories. How do they do that? Well, they use a specific training protocol, which is called fear conditioning. Now, in this experiment, the animal, the mouse, is first placed into a neutral environment, like the yellow box shown here. Nothing happens. The animal is quite happy being there. After a while, a sound appears. The animal is still happy, going around and exploring the space. Now, if you pair together with the sound an electrical shock at the bottom of the cage, the animal will respond with fear. It is afraid that it is going to be food shocked. After a while, this pairing of the sound and the electrical shock causes an associative memory. The mouse will start responding with fear at the mere appearance of the sound alone. Okay, so the scientists in Alcino Silva lab were also able to identify which are the particular cells in the amygdala that contain such associative memories. If you delete these cells, with, if you target them and delete them with a particular technique, then the memory disappears completely. The mouse will no longer respond with fear to the sound. If you re-establish or reactivate these cells, then the memory comes back. This means that the memory, the fear memory, is in its entirety stored into these neurons. 
And where all this was done was shown in the amygdala, similar findings were also seen in the hippocampus. This is in another experiment where the animal essentially learns the context. A context would be a blue box with blue stars, for example. And again, you can find the same neurons that code for this particular memory. Isn't it really impressive that you can actually now put your finger onto the set of neurons that code for these associative memories? Well, wait, there's something that is even more impressive than this. In the lab of Susumu Tonegawa at MIT, who, by the way, won the Nobel Prize a few years ago, scientists were able to show that you can use this information to implant false memories into these poor animals. And if you've seen the movie Inception, this should sound familiar. If you haven't, go see it, please. So how do they do that? Well, they used a technique, a fancy technique, which is called optogenetics. With optogenetics, one can selectively express a protein called channerodopsin into the membrane of these neurons, the particular neurons that have the memory we're talking about. Now, this particular protein is activated by light, leading to the generation of electrical impulses into the neurons that are activated by light. Using these techniques, they can create a false communication between cells. So, what they did precisely was to use this technique to activate the memory of fear into this mouse. In the beginning, you see it's moving around. And then when light appears, the cells are reactivated, and this animal was previously exposed to fear learning. So when these cells are activated, it will go into a corner, like the one you see here, and it stops moving because it's recalling the fear memory. Remember that this fear memory was activated by simply lighting up these neurons, right? Now, here is a particular experiment of the implantation. First, they take a mouse and they put it into an environment which is uh, left to explore. For example, the blue box here. After a while, the animal learns the specific coordinates or the features in this box. This memory is stored into a set of neurons, the white cells here. So after a while, they express channel rhodopsin into these neurons, as we said before, and then they take the same animal and they put it in a completely different environment. This would be the red box. Now, while lighting up these neurons with light stimulation, they also delivered an electrical foot shock in this new environment. Why do they do that? Because they want to associate the activation of the cells that code for the blue box with the fear response that happens in the red box. After a while, this memory is indeed created. How do we see that? Well, when they put the mouse back into the blue box without any stimulation at all, while just moving around, the memory of the blue box comes back, so these neurons are activated, and together with these neurons, the, the memory of fear also comes back, and the animal starts freezing. It's responding with fear in an environment where it was never shocked before. A false memory has been implanted. Now, all these wonderful experiments tell us what is the cellular trace of an associative memory. In other words, which neurons in our brain contain this memory. But how is this all possible? How can we create such traces? To understand this, we have to go to the basics and think of what happens in our brain when we learn something new. Now, we know that neurons communicate with synaptic contacts, like the one shown here. Now, these synaptic contacts change in strength and size while we learn something. For example, if a given crosstalk between two cells is very active, then the synapse will grow in size. It will get bigger and bigger, like the one shown by the red arrow. Moreover, protein products are products in order to allow this change. These protein products travel to neighboring spines. So these neighboring spines have the ability to also undergo change if they capture these products. Now, they do that only if they are also activated in a small temporal window, like the pairing of the sound and the food shock. So if you have two memories that you wish to associate, these two have to appear close in time. And we believe that the mechanism that allows these associations is exactly this synaptic plasticity and the sharing of protein products. Now, to test this hypothesis, in my lab, we use computational models. These computational models are much like virtual neurons. What you see here is a set of such virtual neurons. They are very similar to the real ones in shape and in terms of their biophysics. 
What is more important is that we can use these models like real cells. We can stimulate them, we can record from them, but more importantly, we can manipulate their properties in ways that are not feasible yet in a wet lab. We can make them longer, bigger, shorter, and so on. We can use these models to generate predictions that would let then lead to the following experiments. So that's why models are particularly useful. So for the question of memory associations, we have developed a different model, a more simplified one, which is shown here. What you see here is a large-scale network model of the hippocampus. The neurons are simpler in shape, but they contain plastic synapses, which are shown here in the colorful circles. Now, imagine that the light circles code for Mark's keys, and the dark circles, the red ones, code for the coffee table where the keys should be located on. If we present these two objects repeatedly into this network, then their synaptic contacts go, grow bigger in size. And you will see that the red circles are bigger, both the light ones and the dark ones. And they are also located next to each other within the same branch, thus within the same cell. Okay? So a very powerful prediction that comes out from this model is that the way we believe memory associations are created is by storing them into the same branches or the same neurons. And we can achieve that by presenting them in close temporal proximity, at least for the model that I'm discussing today. Now, why am I telling you all these things? What do all these things have to do with our friend Mark, who is actually sitting over there? And he tries to retrieve his keys, his efforts to retrieve his keys. So let's go back to him. So do you remember what he started doing? He wanted to identify the last moment that he remembered where he had placed his keys. So he traveled back mentally in time to the previous evening. He remembered that he was driving back from work into the garage and slowly parking his car. Then he got out of the car and locked the door. He took the keys in his hands and walked up the stairs. Upon entering the house, he heard the phone ringing. He rushed to pick it up in the study room, and to do that, he had to place his keys next to the phone device. And that's where he found them. This mental exercise reactivated the cells of neurons that coded for these successive memories. First, the memory of the garage excited a cell of neurons, a set of neurons. Now, these neurons partially also contained pieces of the next memory, the phone ringing. So these cells also were activated. And finally, a third set of neurons, which contained the location of his keys. They were the result of the second memory activation. So this sequence of events led to the aha moment. So that's where my keys are located for Mark. So the goal of my talk today was to tell you that neuroscience is much like a crossroad, since the theme of our meeting today is crossroads. So in our quest or efforts to understand the neural mechanisms of memory formation in the brain, um, information from animal models, from theoretical models, from fancy molecular techniques come together to help us understand our own experiences. So that my friend Mark here, and all marks among you no longer have to wonder where the cell are their keys. Thank you. <laughs>